okay good morning to all of you um okay you were in the angelic sphere singing away now you've come to the battlefield of the old testament where there's a lot of judgment and wrath and uh, you know anger happening uh, so okay so we let's just get started uh, today hopefully we will be able to get a good look at now habakkuk okay so today we are dealing with nahu and habakkuk um so the book of nahum talks about god's judgment against nineveh so yesterday we looked at god wanting to show mercy to nineveh wanting to give them an one more opportunity before his you know judgment comes and uh, the people in fact took the opportunity but they did not remain in him after about 5 to 6 years they must have turned away from him because we see that after 10 years tiglath pileser comes and takes control of the city and uh, from then on uh, the assyrian kingdom re uh, regains its power and uh, even the northern kingdom also is destroyed by them so all of these events occur and uh, so we see that nineveh's repentance was true but it did not last very long uh, the lesson that we could pick up from that is that uh, it is good to repent it's the best thing that we can do to come back to the lord and you know confess our sins and renew, renew our commitment to him but that alone is not enough we also need to remain in him continue in him um, and not get drawn back into the uh, wrong things of the world or oh, that did not happen here with the people of nineveh who went back to their old ways and so they did not continue to enjoy the blessings of yahweh so we see that um, god gives nineveh another 150 years to change their ways god is never speedy with his judgment so whenever we see the judgment uh, stories mentioned in the old testament we need to remember that god did not act in haste he waited he allowed many many opportunities and only when the appointed time had come only then was the judgment released so god always gives every person every nation enough time so here we see that god gives them another 150 years after the visit of jonah to again change their ways if they wish to and uh, so uh, the destruction of nineveh uh, it happens 150 years later after jonah's visit so nahum is the one who gives the prophecy about it uh, he was a contemporary of zephaniah and uh, jeremiah so zephaniah and jeremiah also were ministering at this particular time so just to know a little bit of background nahum had the privilege of you know doing his ministry under a very godly king because it was josiah who was on the throne at this time and among all the kings that we you know come across here in this um, you know latter days of the kingdom we see that josiah is among the best he is one person who really goes uh, the entire way you know once he discovers that scroll in the temple and once he realizes that he is not really keeping all of the mosaic law he really commits himself to changing himself changing his people going even into the north northern uh, you know portions of israel and sending priests over there prophets over there to even teach to the people over there god's ways so here is one man who was really committed to the lord and uh, uh, so in nahum 1 uh, verse 15 we see a reference to what was being done during the time of josiah if someone could read out nahum chapter 1 verse 15 Okay, so here um, it mentions uh, that the people are celebrating their festivals and fulfilling their vows. So this was happening under the kingship of Josiah, where people were actually had come back to God. They were following God, and so the Lord says, because of this attitude of yours, you know, during this time, you no enemy will come into this land and harm you. so it says here no more will wicked invade you they will be completely destroyed 
so because of the uh, revival that had taken place in the land and because of the good attitude of the people now god speaks hope he says to them that ultimately judgment will have to come but um, those who are righteous you know they will be taken care of they will be protected so that's the assurance that god is giving over here uh, to those who are following him um so during this time of peace uh, which they were enjoying over here there was however a threat because now assyria had begun to regain its power now it was no longer under the previous dynasty uh, uh, now it was under tiglath-pileser and he and his followers not followers his descendants they were all very very ambitious cruel uh, powerful people and so assyria was getting stronger and stronger and the people who were living in south uh, you know judah with their own eyes they saw what assyria had done to northern israel they had seen how that entire um, area was completely wiped out all the people taken away they saw all of that destruction and now they were worried and they were thinking is something like that going to happen even to us okay so um, in this time god gives this assurance you know and he says in nahum 115 no more will the wicked invade you because you are following my ways you will enjoy my protection during this time god assures them um so uh, so at around this time is when nahum gives his prophecy of what actually is going to happen to nineveh so uh, shortly before the fall of nineveh uh, is when he writes down this prophecy nineveh actually falls in 612 bc okay so um when nahum gives his prophecy he says that within 50 years uh, within 50 years of um this prophecy nineveh will be completely destroyed uh, and um, whatever he says you know is fulfilled uh, let's just look at the structure of nahum chapter 1 is where he talks about the judgment which will come he talks about the greatness of god the awesomeness of god uh, you know if someone could read out uh, chapter 1 verse 5 what happens at his, at his presence is the world and all who dwell in it yes so it talks he, he reminds of the power of god because the people are feeling scared they're wondering what's going to happen will assyria come and attack them so here nahum is giving the assurance that the mountains quake before the lord okay so god is all powerful he is in a position to take care of them and then in chapters 2 to 3 is where he gives the judgment against nineveh that's described in great detail in you know, in in those chapters maybe we could just look at uh, nahum chapter 3 verse 7 Okay, so the destruction will be so bad that uh, people will not even want to go anywhere near that territory. Okay, because the enemy will come so powerfully and attack so badly that all the others stay away. Nobody tries to help them. Nobody tries to go near them. So that will be the condition. Is what uh, Nahum predicts. Um, so we learn that after that, Nineveh kind of uh, does not recover and. nobody goes and resettles in that particular area and it was only in the 19th century that you know in the early 1900s that archaeologists in fact uncovered this place nineveh and they discovered that there used to be a huge great city and it was it had beautiful palaces it had large gardens all that is something which they discovered only now recently in the 19th century because god wiped out that city so completely that nobody ever inhabited that place after that that place was just left as ruins that was the level of destruction which came upon uh, nineveh now just to give a little background about nineveh itself at the time of chona it was an it was an influential provincial center but at that time it was just still a provincial center it is tiglath pileser who later on makes nineveh his capital 
once he makes it his capital, he starts making that place very, very grand and big. Nineveh was positioned in such a place that um, it's near the uh, Tigris River actually goes through the city. And the Tigris River is going through the city at, at a very important point where you know most of the ships will come for their um, trade. So they have to take that particular route. As they are taking their trade route, they have to come near Nineveh, and then from there they would you know go to other directions. So which means uh, these people can make a lot of money through taxation. You know all the uh, ships which are coming over there will have to pay something because they are the ones who have built the infrastructure over there for all the ships and all to come and dock and all of that. So. Uh, they were making a lot of money. They were in a very good position. And they also tried to control the flow of the waters. Because, uh, you know, Tigris is actually going to pass through their city. And so they built some dam, um, you know, this, what you call sluice gates. So when you open up the gates, the flow of the river increases. When you close up the gates, it slows down. So the idea was that when during rainy season, when the, when the you know, uh, chances are that the river will flood. They would close off the sluice gates so that the flow of the water will be controlled so that there's no damage inside the city. So all these elaborate arrangements were done by Tiglath Pileser and his followers. And also they built many grand palaces inside. Um, this person, um, Senna Sherib, you know, the one who actually comes and destroys northern Israel, he builds a, a huge palace for himself so actually when the archaeologists first discovered these things it became very important news i mean the the news about it spread everywhere and they had put photographs of it in those early days long back in the early 1900s so this was a very great finding because the palaces were so huge so lavish uh, and they had all these wonderful uh, carvings done inside on the walls uh who was that person um uh, ashur banipal yeah especially his palace um, he had all these large stone panels on the sides in which they had done elaborate carving of uh, battle scenes and the victories which he had uh, you know, achieved, all of that. So all of this proved that the Assyrians were a great and powerful nation and uh, that they had achieved a lot. Okay, so all these things uh, the archaeologists discovered about them. They also discovered what kind of a people these Assyrians were. So I'm not sure whether the earlier Assyrians were that bad, but this last dynasty, Tiglath Pileser's dynasty, were very, very violent and evil. Um, so in those carvings, uh, in those battle scenes, you can see what kind of violence they were indulging in, which is why Nahum 3.1, it says something about the city. If someone could read out Nahum chapter 3, verse 1. says here it is a it is a city full of blood it says that it's uh, that it is never without any without victims always somebody is being tortured over there always somebody is suffering over there so they are a very harsh and evil people just for us to know a little bit about uh, them um, you know we have uh, yeah, we have in Second Chronicles 33, 11, where you have a description of you know Manasseh being dragged away uh, in, um, by the Assyrians. Uh, they literally put a hook in his nose. Imagine a metal hook. Uh, they didn't exactly have surgical instruments at that time. So however they put that hook in there, would have been very horrible and very painful. And he's dragged like an animal. So the idea was that you know they're trying to say, oh, this man is no longer a king. Now he's just a beast. Look at him crawling along the ground. We are taking him, taking him like as if he is an animal. Okay, they wanted to prove their greatness. Uh, that was the kind of people they were. And then you also see in the carvings that they would put the victims on the ground and then uh, you know facing down. They would be put flat on the ground, facing with the face downward. And from the back, they would start cutting the skin so that they can open up the entire skin as like one single piece, you know. And they thought that was a very artistic thing to do. Absolutely no sense of mercy, very evil, probably demon possessed. I mean, I don't know. I don't think normal people can indulge in that kind of things. So um, a very terrible evil people. There's one particular uh, scene uh, where you have Ashur Banipal and his queen. 
uh, they're sitting at the royal table and they're celebrating the victory which they have won over over a place called Elam. Okay, and the Elamites. Um, so you have the Elamites king's cut off head hanging from the tree next to the you know like a decoration piece. They're sitting over there and having their feast. So these were extremely evil people. And that is why finally when the destruction comes upon them, the city is wiped out to such an extent. Nobody even lived over there again. You know, it says that's what we read, right? It says the earlier verses, no one is even coming near you. Where was that? Uh, chapter 3, verse 7, it says, um, and it will come about that all who see you will shrink fr from you and say they will not even want to come near. You know, they will all try to move away from that area. And so Nineveh just got lost over the centuries. Nobody even knew that it existed anymore uh, because that was God's judgment against this very, very evil uh, people. Uh, so how does God bring about the judgment? Uh, we don't get any historical details over here, but just some specifics which are mentioned. Uh, if, uh, if someone could read out Nahum chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Okay, so we just get these few phrases and we wonder what is the story behind it? What exactly was happening? What are they talking about when they're saying there were chariots racing around the streets, uh, looking like flames, uh, flaming torches and all of that. And the, the only reason we know more details about this is because the Greek historian, ancient Greek historian, Diodorus Siculus, or however on earth you pronounce the poor man's name, um, he wrote the Bibliotheca Historia. So in his Bibliotheca Historia, he also gives an account of the fall of Nineveh. And that is uh, from there we get details of what actually happened over there, how Nineveh falls. So we see that actually the attack happens in three stages. When they first come to that place, what Senna Sherib had done during his time was that he you had the normal uh, you know city with its fortification walls which was there even in the time of jonah that was already there but he uh, built another extra outer wall with many hectares of land in between so you have an inner city where you have the actual city walls you also have an outer city wall which you know with, with a lot of distance between the inner and the outer walls and uh, in that space you know he built gardens and he had irrig irrigation projects and whatnot uh, so it was this elaborate setup. So when the um, when the Babylonians first come over there, they don't come on their own. They come along with the Medes. So the Medes and Babylonians together, they come over there and they attack the outer wall because they want to get in and they're unable to. The, all the um, soldiers who are standing on the, on the, on the battlements, they're able to you know, throw their arrows and I don't know what else they threw, maybe boiling water, whatever. So they use different uh, you know, weapons to uh, defeat them. And the enemy could not get through because the, the walls which had been built by Sena Sharif were that strong. And it, uh, the entire fortification had been done in such an excellent manner. And so after this great victory, the enemy is sitting out there, you know, uh, wondering how are we going to get inside? How are we going to, you know, bring down the emperor who's inside? Uh, so while that is going on, the soldiers begin their celebration. You know, they have uh, had a tough battle, they have won the battle. And so now they start their celebrations. They all get properly drunk and uh, they're not no longer in their senses. Some of the people who are escaping from the city, you know, the deserters who have escaped, they come and inform the uh, Babylonian soldiers that you know what inside uh, the Ninevites are all properly drunk you can actually attack so they decide to attack during the night time so during the night time they are able to form an opening somewhere in the wall and they're able to get inside so now they are in that in, be in between space you still have the central city inside with its own fortification but now they are inside the outer space so that is basically the you know, account mentioned over here, the chariots have now finished coming inside and they are racing around 
uh, you know, and you can uh, the metal on them is shining like you know, it's poetic language is being used. The metal on these um, you know chariots is shining in the sunlight, and now Nineveh is like panicky, you know, because now they realize they have come inside. So now the next wall will be the inner wall. Already the main thing, you know, main damage has been done. So they are very scared, and it says over here uh, in um, chapter two, verse five. Nineme summons her picked troops, yet they stumble on their way. They dash to the city wall. The protective shield is put in place because now they have to defend the inner thing. Outer one is gone, but the inner one they could still, you know, try to do something about it. And uh, so then uh, these uh, Babylonians and Medes they come up with a plan on how to destroy this inner wall. So what they do is now that they're already inside the, uh, you know, the outer thing, they're inside the periphery. Now what they do is they open up the sluice gates of the Tigris River. And already during the heavy, because of the heavy rains during that particular time, you know, that particular season, the northeastern part of the wall, inner wall, had become weak. So once the sluice gates of the Tigris River is fully opened up and the water starts flooding against the walls, that portion of the wall is completely weakened. They're able to break through. And the waters gush into the thing city, in fact, flooding a lot of it. Finally, when the news comes to the emperor, you know, the king who is sitting in his palace, he realizes it's finished. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be captured. So he thinks I should not fall into the hands of these Babylonians. They will disgrace me. They will mock me. Um, you know, so uh, he doesn't want anyone in his uh, royal family touched either. He literally, on his own, he burns, he puts fire all around the palace. So everyone inside the palace literally gets, you know, burnt. They all, you could say, like maybe it's a mass suicide. I would say it's a mass murder because he initiates it. He murders his entire family, which is there inside, and he dies over there. And that is basically how this, um, you know, Assyrian kingdom comes to an end. You still, of course, have a small batch of people. They move to another place and they try to start over over there in Haran, I think. So all that, uh, there's still a more story, but basically, the Assyrian kingdom is finished. Uh, you know, um, so yeah. So that is God's judgment upon them. Um, maybe we could get into the book of Habakkuk. Because over there, we have a little bit of continuation of this story. What happens to those who are still left over? You know, some of the, uh, the small bunch of Assyrians who have survived this attack. Uh, so we, we, we get details of that uh, when, we will, when we are going through the Habakkuk um, book. So we have, um, you know, very briefly looked at the prophet Nahum and his uh, judgment on Nineveh. Moving into the book of Habakkuk, uh, we see that uh, he talks about um, the judgment which will come upon Judah, but he is also asking God a series of questions. So mainly Habakkuk uh, is more like a dialogue between God and him. He asks questions and God answers. And... Uh, Sometimes what the answer which God gives is not directly the uh, with regard to the question which He asked. So uh, there's a lot of you know analysis that can be done regarding that. But we will just very briefly look at the structure, overall structure of Habakkuk. So in the first section, maybe we could divide Habakkuk into three sections. The first section would be chapter one up to chapter two, verse five. Okay, so chapter one. And chapter 2 up to verse 5, so 1 to 2, 5, okay, is where Habakkuk is, is asking questions. These are the questions which he asks. Habakkuk is looking at the evil which is increasing in Judah. The people are becoming more and more sinful. The poor people are being deprived of even the most basic rights. Okay, it's the, the evil, the, the rich people are getting richer and nobody cares about uh, justice. And there's a lot of corruption. And Habakkuk says, Lord, look at the look. And in fact, in one verse, he says, Lord, why do you make me look at evil? Because he's unable to bear what is being done in the land. Uh, when I was going through this book, I was thinking, oh my, it almost sounds like India. You know, so because uh, 
our lower strata uh, of society is in a very bad shape. We middle class, we manage. But the ones who are, nobody even seems to care about their rights and privileges. And the people in power, <laughs> they're so rich, they don't know what to do with the helicopters, where to park them. You know, so it's like a very, very bad uh, state of affairs. So Habakkuk says, Lord, why are you delaying justice? Why are we not seeing justice come? And God's answer is, yes, there will be justice. I will send the Babylonians, and the Babylonians will punish them. When God says that, Habakkuk is horrified. He says, Lord, already so much injustice is happening. Now we are going to use people who are even more sinful than the Judahite people to come and punish them. Lord, how can you use evil to, uh, to, to do something you know good, like bring judgment? How, Lord? So then God says, um, God does not give a direct answer to that. All that the Lord says is, the righteous will live, but it's the arrogant who will perish. That would be in chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. So basically, you have two questions. First question, Lord, when will justice come? And God says, yes, justice will come. It will come through the Babylonians. Then Habakkuk immediately asks, how, Lord, how can you use somebody so evil to bring about justice? Wouldn't that be almost like a greater injustice? And then God says, no, the righteous will be spared. But it's the arrogant who will perish. And in, in fact, you know, this is true, right? Because you have people like Daniel, uh, you know, going into exile. Uh, you have godly people uh, like, you know, this uh, uh, Nehemiah. And, uh, and you have uh, uh, Ezekiel. And you have all these godly people who are spared. So, uh, so we see the Lord does take care of his own. Um, so in the second section of Habakkuk, that would be chapter 2 verses 6 to 20. Okay, so chapter 2, verses 6 to 20 is where God declares five judgments against the arrogant. What will happen to them? Okay, so the details of that are given in your second section. Coming to the third section, that would be chapter 3. So in chapter 3, after listening to what God has to say, um, Habakkuk, he, in fact, very openly, he says, I've not quite understood all the things that you have said, Lord. You know, I asked a question and you have answered, but I haven't really understood all that you have said. But one thing I have realized, you're very powerful. Nothing can stop you. Once you decide to do something, it will be accomplished. So he talks about God's greatness, God's awesomeness. And then he says, Lord, I will wait upon you. OK, so I have not fully understood what you're going to be doing. Uh, because it's it's it sounds very horrifying to me that you're going to bring an evil nation to judge my people and uh, that sounds uh, terrible to me but he says lord i will just wait upon you because i know that you are a, a awesome and great god and so he ends habakkuk uh, with you know verses 17 to 19 where he says i will rejoice in the lord i will trust him and stay confident in him. I don't understand what's going on. I don't quite understand what the Lord is going to do. But I choose to rejoice in him and trust him. Because he is someone who is worthy of our full, complete trust. So there are many times when we don't really understand what God is doing. And why he is doing things a particular way. But one thing we can be sure of. That he can be fully trusted. So if someone could read out uh, um, Habakkuk chapter 3. 3 verses 17 to 19. They're very famous, you know, uh, verses. Habakkuk 3.17. Ah. Okay, so he says, a stage will come when no longer will the crops grow the way they, the way they are meant to. Uh, you know, there will be poverty, there will be financial struggle. Yes, all of those things will happen to my nation. But even on that day, when that day arrives, I will trust in God. I will rejoice because God said that he will take care of the righteous. 
he will bring justice to those who are following him and trusting in him. So he says, in spite of all that's going to happen, I will continue to exercise my confidence in the Lord. So the book basically ends in that way, where Habakkuk has not fully understood what God is saying, but he has chosen to place his trust in the Lord. Um, now, uh, regarding you know the things that God says about how He is going to use Babylon to bring judgment on Judah, um, unfortunately, we see that Judah also had a small role in helping the Babylonians become strong. If they had listened to the Lord and if they had been more careful, then maybe the Babylonians would not have become as strong as they did. Okay, so this is mistake which happens on Judah's side, to be more specific, it's a mistake which Josiah makes. A very, very godly man, loved the Lord, did all that he could to bring revival in his land. But when one particular instruction was given by the Lord, he fails to follow the guidance which God is giving. And because of his mistake, actually in the process, Babylon becomes stronger than they were before. Uh, so we'll just look at that very briefly. Um, like, you know, we, we, we saw Nineveh fell in 612 BC. So then those who are left over, you know, some of the survivors, um, they and the soldiers, they go to a place called Haran uh, and they start, um, you know, trying to rebuild their uh, kingdom over there. Uh, for a few years, they try. But then uh, you have the next Babylonian dynasty, which, you know, which, uh, the, you have an, an, one particular di dynasty of the Babylonians. They come and they defeat them. So from there, they leave that place and they go to one more place called Karshemish. So Karshemish is basically in the land of Egypt. So the Egyptian king, the Egyptian pharaoh gives them shelter. He gives the leftover Assyrians shelter and he says, I will help you in, you know, in rebuilding yourselves. So these people are now sitting in Karshemish and um, um, Babylon keeps coming now and then and attacking the Assyrian people living over there. And then uh, the Pharaoh says, I am going to go and help them in Karshemish, you know, because there's a battle which is going to happen between the Babylonians and the Assyrians, the leftover Assyrians who are over there. And I want to go and, you know, from my palace, uh, wherever his capital is, from there he wants to go to Karshemish and help the Assyrians in fighting against the Babylonians. For him to come from his capital city to Karshemish, he has to go through the Philistine land. And all these Philistine lands had been reclaimed by Josiah. Josiah, who was faithful to the Lord, he was able to win back all these territories. So now these Philistine territories are no longer under Philistine control. They are under the hand of Josiah. And Josiah rises up and says, how dare Pharaoh Nico goes through my territory? And so he, you know, he raises up an army and he comes to fight against uh, Pharaoh Necho. And Pharaoh Necho, this you have an account of this in Second Chronicles chapter thirty-five, verses twenty to twenty-four, where the Pharaoh says, "I don't have any quarrel with you." Maybe you could actually read that Second Chronicles uh, chapter thirty-five and uh, verse twenty-one. If, yeah, if you could read out verse twenty-one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, here uh, he says, this Pharaoh says, I don't have any battle with you. I'm just passing through this territory because I need to go to Karshemish because I want to, you know, control this Babylonian. So we're getting too strong. So something needs to be done. So just allow me to pass through. And he makes a statement over here. He says, God also has given me permission to do this. God wants me to go there as quickly as possible and help these Assyrians to uh, you know, control the Babylonians. Um, and then uh, in uh, if we could also read the next verse, verse 23. Uh, Second Chronicles 35 uh, was... Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, 22. <laughs> Josiah, however, yeah. Mm. Mm. 
okay so uh, it looks like as if god actually urged and motivated the pharaoh to go and help the assyrians against the babylonian power and so josiah should have just stepped aside and said okay let god do what god wants to do but josiah is determined for some reason this very very godly man decides to take matters into his own hands and he thinks no no i should not allow this pharaoh to go through my territory so he actually disguises himself you know so that no one will recognize that the king is actually going into battle he disguises himself and he goes to fight in the plains of megiddo when he does that he gets badly wounded you know one of the arrows hits him and uh, so he's bleeding to death uh, so they bring him back to jerusalem and he dies over there very sad way for such an amazing man to die for so unnecessary if he had just listened to you know whatever god is telling him if he had consulted god and found out lord this neko is saying that it's your will you know he should go to karchemish is that true you know if he had at least consulted but it looks like josiah did not consult the the lord regarding this matter and so he basically gets killed in this unnecessary battle and uh, what happens is that even though he gets killed uh, you know his soldiers are able to uh, fight neko to such an extent that neko's army gets badly damaged they were in a good state they could have made an impact on the babylonians you know and, and kept them under control but after this battle they are no longer strong enough to fight against the babylonians so indirectly judah contributed to strengthening the babylonians making them extra strong and of course like we know you know finally the babylonians um, they come in three stages and they uh, attack judah so because of a little bit of deafness on the part of the king because he was reluctant to hear what god is saying because he was reluctant to consult god before taking action you know uh, something unfortunate happened okay so that's one thing that we that we see over here um uh, so uh, habakkuk you know um the lord says i will use this instrument of babylon to bring judgment upon judah and uh, so this is basically how god does it he allows the foolishness of the king to work against uh, you know the the people of judah and uh, babylon is unnecessarily strengthened uh, because of you know josiah's lack of you know obedience um so just coming to another one point that you know uh, one or two things that we can look at in habakkuk uh, one uh, one thing which we see in habakkuk is that habakkuk asks god a lot of questions and he asks them very openly very plainly uh, you know he says why lord are you making me watch all this evil why are you delaying why are you not answering his questions are very direct and we have this teaching you know uh, which is taught by people saying never question god just accept what is happening do not ask god questions if you ask god questions that is a sin and you will be punished so how do we approach this whole issue can you ask god questions are you not supposed to ask god questions what about some people who asked questions and nothing bad happened to them but then there are also examples of some people who asked questions and god was very angry and you know he punished them so are we supposed to ask god questions or are we not supposed to ask god questions so here in this case habakkuk when he was asking these questions it looks like god was not angry with him at all in fact you know god answers him god tries to explain things to him and so here it seems to be quite all right and uh, when mary she asks god no how how will this thing be you know when she is told that she is going to give birth to a child even though she is not married uh, so she says how will this be and god is not angry zechariah on the other hand you know when god says him in your old age you're going to have a child and then uh, you know uh, uh, he says uh, how can i be sure god makes him dumb he can't talk anymore so why what happened what was wrong so is there a correct way to question god and is there a wrong way to question god yeah that uh, conference going on over there if it can wait till later so yeah 
so what is the correct way to ask a question and what is the wrong way to ask a question we see that in habakkuk's case and in mary's case they are very very clear about who god is about the character of god whether he can be trusted or not no doubt about that they know that god is fair god is just god is compassionate and that god is all powerful they have no problems with that all they're asking is god oh why are you using this strategy it doesn't make any sense so habakkuk says why are you taking such an evil nation and using them to judge my people judah who are actually not that wicked they are wicked but not as wicked as that nation and so god tries to explain to him why he is using babylon as an instrument so habakkuk is very clear in his heart about how he is asking the question he is not questioning god's character he is not questioning god's name he is just trying to uh, ask for clarification lord i want to know the details i want to know why you are doing it in this particular way could you please explain to me okay so there is a right attitude uh, when he is asking his uh, questions um what are you people discussing if it's a question you ask me i shall help you so um in the same way mary no mary does not say no i don't want to do your will you see she does not even make a statement like that all she says is but how will this be because you see now she's not married so what is she supposed to do where is she supposed to go go what what procedure all she's asking is for details for clarity on what to do god has said something she wants to you know submit to god but she doesn't know and then the lord explains and says uh, you don't have to do anything the holy spirit will come upon you and you know you will bear the child so uh, so here too she is asking with the right attitude she just wants clarification on the other hand zechariah after being told that this great miracle of bearing a child is going to happen he says how can i be sure he says in luke chapter 1 verse 18 and it says in luke 1:18 he was rebuked because you know it says over here you did not believe my words so in zechariah's case the question he asked you know he's like he's he's basically like saying oh you're saying it's possible uh, how is it possible is questioning god's power is questioning god's ability to do something great so he is questioning the character of god in the way he is asking his question so when you have a question to the lord with what attitude are you coming to him with that question are you just seeking an explanation because it's it seems very un, beyond understanding and you just want the lord to explain to you because you're a child and god sometimes doesn't mind giving you the details so you come and say lord i know your character i know who you are i know you capable i know you loving i know you fair i just could you give me an explanation of why things are going this particular way why you are allowing your will to work in this particular way and god may choose to give you an explanation on the other hand god may choose not to give an explanation like in the case of job that is up to the lord but your approach is right on the other hand if you come to him questioning the way the israelites tended to do you know in the in the in, in um, exodus and all where they would be like ha ah, so you care about us is it you have brought us over here to kill us all is desert is it see the way the questioning is being done they are literally questioning his character and his motives do you have good motives in doing what you are doing or are you really you know uh, who, someone who doesn't care about us so you see the entire questioning is being done in a way where there is no faith there is no trust there is no that that sense of trust is not there that faith is missing so ask your questions with the attitude of faith fully trust in him fully knowing that he is very very fair and just and he may in fact be willing to give you an answer you know for those questions or he may just say you know at the current time it's not for you to know you know one day later you'll, you'll be told about why it happened in this particular way so that's up to the lord whether he chooses to answer or not but we need to question him in the with the with the correct attitude with the right kind of approach uh, so yeah that's just something i wanted to touch upon um yeah do we have any questions um otherwise maybe yeah we could just conclude all right then let's um close with word of prayer 
Lord, we just thank you so much uh, for your great faithfulness towards your people. Lord, you said that you will watch over your righteous, even in the day of judgment, even when um, everything around us is uh, breaking down, we can be sure that if we are holding on to you, and if we have kept our heart right with you, uh, if we are following you sincerely, you will uh, help us and you will cause your will to be done in our lives. So we thank you, O oh Lord, that you never fail and you never betray the trust that we place in you. you because you are an amazingly faithful God. You are righteous, you are just, you are good. And so, O oh Lord, even when we are going through struggles and strifes, um, when we have so many questions in our minds, and when we want to bring those questions before you, help us to know that you are good. Help us to come there with that assurance that you are good and you are very faithful and you will never let us down. Help us, O oh Lord, to have uh, the kind of attitude that Habakkuk did. Even though he did not quite understand all the explanation that you gave, he said that he will patiently wait on you and uh, see whether he would understand things further and he would continue to rejoice even when things break down because he trusted in you to that level. Help us, O oh Lord, to be like that. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you so much for those of you who are online. And uh, you know the assessment is posted, uh, so you can start working on it. Even if you're able to cover maybe 10 questions per day, you know, 10 ticks, tick marks, um, you will be able to finish it, you know, in time. So that should be all right. So all right. Thank you.